So thanks for coming today to this talk. Um, so quickly to introduce myself, my name is Audrey. I am developer relation at streamdata.io. I'm also the co-leader in France of DevOx for Kids, which I hope you all know. Uh, if you don't, we got a buff this uh, uh, tonight at eight, I think. So feel free to come. Um, so. My goal today is to live code a mobile application which will give us the internal spaceship station position in real time. So I got less than 15 minutes 15 minute to do it. And it has to be iOS and Android compatible. So to retrieve the, uh, the position of the ESS, I'm going to use this API, which is open source. You can find it on GitHub. Find the whole code on GitHub. It's pretty cool. And to win the bet, I'm going to use um, Ionic for the mobile hybrid part of the challenge. And for the real-time part of the challenge, I'm going to use streamdata.io, which is a proxy available as SAS mode, which turns every JSON API into a stream of data. So Ionic, we're going to quickly introduce Ionic for those, who, those um, of you who don't know about it. Uh, it's based on AngularJS and Apache Cordova. So if we want to make a parallel, we can think uh, about Ionic as the Twitter bootstrap, but for mobile hybrid applications, that what his creator, his, their creator was having in mind. Um, they were looking to have a framework component-based uh, with which we can easily design mobile application which works on every devices, which looks great, native, beautiful, without being a CSS master, which is not my case. And I think, I think they, they really make, make it. It's a really cool framework. So an Ionic application looks like this. It's a hybrid mobile application, which means that it's a web view bundled into a native application. A web view is simply a browser. So we are going to use HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript for the interface. If you, if you like to use um, SAS and LESS, you can also. And then we are going to use um, Ionic framework components. So Ionic comes with a bundle of components um, it can be uh, services or it can be front-end component, like you got a very nice spinner, for example, which can already use uh, by just calling the good method uh, in your code. All the logic behind is already implemented. It's already beautifully designed in CSS. You can customize it if you need. So you're going to design your application in a really fast way. Then we are going to use AngularJS for all the business logic, which means that we are going to have directive and services, and we are going to use the Angular router system, for example. So if you are familiar with Angular, you will be very comfortable with the code we are going to see. And then we got Cordova, uh, who will be in charge, which will be in charge of two very important tasks. The first one is um, it will give us access to all the uh, material APIs. So if you plan to use the camera or Bluetooth or whatever, you will do this with Cordova. And then it will be in charge of compiling the applications towards native platform. So now talking about real time. So when we are talking about real time, usually we are thinking about long polling. And long polling is not a perfect solution. So it's what you're seeing on the schema there. I'm making a request waiting for the answer, making the same request again, waiting for the answer, and so on and so forth. So it works, obviously, uh, but you will probably make a lot of useless calls. Retrieve empty responses, same data a few times. How are you going to deal if the, with data you've been missing if the connection is dropped for any reason? And here, in our use case, the data is changing every second. I'm not sure it's the best way to pull the API every second for a mobile application. Web circuits is in a solution, it's uh, well known. It's a very cool technology, it supports uh, binary, it's bidirectional, which means that you can exchange data between the, uh, the server and the client in both directions. Um, the problem with WebSocket is that it, has, it gets its own protocol, which is a TCP-based protocol, so you get to reconfigure your proxy and load balancer. We will not have time to do this in 50 minutes. So, it's a little bit over-engineering for our use case because we are only going to send data from the server to the client, and this is going to be just text. So we're going to use server-sent events, which is a very cool push technology, which basically, once the connection is open between the client and the server, open a streaming channel where the data can be pushed by the server to the client as they happen. It only supports text, but that's fine for our use case. 
So that's the reason why we, we've created Stream.io. It's a proxy. It's completely based on server sent events. And basically, you are going to open a streaming session with us. And we are going to pull the API for you and deal with everything that can go wrong. And you are going to be able to give your parameters, like HTTP headers, query parameters, all that kind of stuff. And we added two uh, very nice features to, again, significantly reducing the number of calls made by adding a dynamic catchy, which means that if your application becomes very popular and new customer joining the, the streaming session don't have to wait until the next poll to retrieve data, they can simply catch it from the last call. And then we are making incremental updates using JSON patch. So it means that, for example, let's say that on the first poll request, we retrieve a first snapshot of data. Fine. On the second one, Nothing has changed. We will not push you any data. It will be a complete nonsense to send you the whole document again. And let's say that on the third document, third poll, only a few lines, a few fields of your document have changed. We are going to make incremental updates. So JSON patch, JSON patch defines a set of application of uh, operations that can be applied to a JSON document. So it can be replaced, removed, etc. And so let's imagine that. It's the snapshot we received on the first call, but on the third call, as we've seen previously, only two fields have changed. Instead of receiving the whole document again, you will receive this, so which is in the JSON patch format, and then you just have to use a JSON patch library to apply it to your document. And that's fine. That's it. So, okay, let's see how it looks like in real life. So, first of all, I'm going to uh, create a new application. So, uh, Ionic has a very cool command line interface, which is based on Apache Cordova, so some commands are similar. Uh, actually, you can just call the Cordova commands and it works. Some of them are completely related to uh, Ionic, like this one. And the very cool thing here is, so I'm telling Ionic, start to create a new application, new application called ESS.io, and with the maps template, because Ionic is coming with a few templates to help you get started with. Uh, so you had, for example, one with a side menu or with tabs, header, that kind of thing. So you can easily you know, have a look at how you are making application in Ionic the right way, and when you feel comfortable, you can move to the blank template. So here it has added an iOS application by default because as I'm working on the OS X, it has automatically added the iOS uh, platform. Unfortunately, if you're not working on iOS, you will not be able to test your application on uh, an emulator of iPhone. You will still be able to test on Android, don't worry, and you will be able to compile things to Ionic uh, tools, online tools. So let's dive into our application and see what it looks like. So I'm going to call the serve dash dash lab command. And this command actually displays this view, which is very nice. It's an emulator in the browser. It gave me uh, both rendering in iOS and Android because there is a few differences. Just keep in mind if you're using it that you can't emulate everything. Uh, you won't be able to emulate every material APIs, for example. But that's still great to debug some CSS, for example. So here we got a map, which is centered on the Ionic headquarters. That's pretty fine. We're going to see how the application looks like. So first of all, there is a few things I need to uh, install in the application. So I'm going to modify the bower.json file to add actually the stream data GS uh, npm package and the fast JSON patch package I'm going to use to apply my patch. So an application, uh, an Ionic application looks like this. It's, it's really a code of application. So you get a hooks folder for all the compilation tasks, pre, post, etc. You get a platform folder with, as you can guess, the iOS platform. You get a plugin folder where Ionic is going to install all plugins you're going to use. But the folder which is going to interest us today is the SwissW, because it's the one we are, where we are going to work. So uh, if we have a look at the index HTML file, we can see that it's a classic Angular application. We got an ng app and an ng controller. Uh, we got here a map object, which in, in fact is just a directive. Yeah, let's zoom in. So this directive actually declares a map options object. 
and a map object, so they are both JavaScript objects from the Google Map APIs. Um, pretty fine, but we are going to modify a little, little bit to fit our use case. So first of all, I'm going to declare a lat long object. Uh, so here I'm giving it cap canaveral position. And then I'm going to recreate a new map options object. I'm going to deactivate Street View Control and tell it to be on the satellite view. So if we're going back to our application, OK, looks better. So now we would like to have um, a marker you know, to follow the, the SS on the map. So we are going to declare it. So it's just another Google Maps um, API object, which take the position to and the map. And we are giving, going to give it this very nice icon. And once again, if we are going back, perfect. So now, as you can see, there is a method there calling onCreate, which has the map as parameters. In fact, this method is used to uh, give the controller handle on the, um, on the map object. So obviously, it will need to have the marker object too, which we are going to give it here. So we are going to add ESS marker and say scope. We're going to give it here too. And finally, there. So at the moment, it's only Angular, and you should feel comfortable with if you are used to. So now, considering the, the real time part. So our API return responses like this. I'm going to copy paste it and create a new application on the Stream Data Tio portal. So you can create an account. It's uh, completely free. I'm just going to reload. Yeah. So let's call it ESS. And here, so a token has been generated, which I will need to open my streaming session. I can copy paste my API there to give it a try, you know, to see what it looks like streaming data from this API in a terminal. So I'm going to copy paste this curl command there. And if I run it there, so the streaming session is open. I received a first event called data. That's my first snapshot. And then I received an event called patch with the new coordinates. And once this is done, I can go back to the My API section and edit the polling frequency, which by default is at five seconds. So here I would like to have one second instead, because I know the position is refreshed every second. And if you get HTTP headers or query parameters to add, that's where you're going to add them to. So now let's go back to the terminal. And we can see that the polling frequency has already been updated without closing and reopening the stream. That's pretty cool. So let's see how we are making it in our application. So first of all, I need to import uh, both libraries. No, that's not this one. Both libraries I've installed with Bower. And then in the controller, I'm going to create an event source object, because that's the way you are uh, dealing with service and events. So I'm going to declare the SD token and the API I want to stream, which I can simply take from my curl command. So this is it. And this one. OK, once this is done, I'm going to create an event source by calling the stream data tile create event source method and giving it the API and the token as parameters. Once this is done, I can register to different callback. The wood first one I would like to register to is on data for to retrieve the first snapshot of data. So it has it will return a function. Um, and here I'm going to assign my snapshot to an object called ESS position. Okay, and then I would like to register to another event called on patch to retrieve patches. Quite obvious. And here I'm going to use the JSON patch library we've mentioned previously. So I'm just calling scope.ess position patches, and it will apply patches to the object previously created. So now, obviously, I need a method to refresh the view. So I'm going to call uh, refresh map method, which basically is just 
um, it's just going to recreate a lat long object as we have seen previously in the directive with new coordinates and pass them to the map and the marker. So I need to call this method obviously in both listener. And to really start streaming, I need to call the open method on my event source. And so just checking, yeah, got my libraries there. So if we are going back to the application, so yeah, it happens sometimes. Uh, it's still in beta mode, so sometimes it doesn't refresh properly both views. So let's refresh it again, better. And we can see it moving. And that's it. So you can find the whole code on uh, our um, blog post uh, demo, se demo in the blog post demo uh, section. And everything is on GitHub. And if you get questions, I don't know if we get a lot of time uh, left, but I'll still be around. So And I get stickers, if you want. <laughs> questions, anyone? OK, fine. So let's come and see me if you get questions after. Thank you.